This week has been a little bit slow for Sea of Thieves. We didn't get a crazy amount of new content information, but we got some little details here and there that weren't all too known yet or haven't been brought to anyone's attention yet. And I want to talk about those today. So we're going to talk about an article by Crew of Thieves looking at the upcoming content patch. Then we're going to look at a minor detail in the Sea of Thieves roundup from last month. And then we're also going to go over the Sea of Thieves podcast that took place recently. And I'm going to summarize that a little bit because it's a 50 minute talk and it can actually be broken down relatively easily. So first of all, the Crew of Thieves article. So Crew of Thieves is a news website for Sea of Thieves, basically regularly posting updates, and they decided that they wanted to check if they can find out more things about the Hungering Deep update coming in May. Same as I already said in my video following up on the update, they expect the first big update to be mermaids or sirens. They basically draw the evidence from the same quotes and everything surrounding the event. But the cool thing that they found are some more images of these particular merfolk. First of all, this image you see here, but then also a transformation image of how a mermaid gradually transforms to become more monster-ish or fish-like or whatever. I suspect that the third last stage here will be what we will be seeing as enemies whereas the other mermaids are actually more the supportive kind of mermaid. There has also been an interesting discovery regarding the art because the art that they looked at there looks very similar to the ruins next to the Uncharted Isles. The Uncharted Isles are a place not marked on the map but if you want to find that place you can see right here where it is so you can go there with your ship right now and you can find those ruins underwater and the islands themselves but unfortunately you can't do anything there yet there's nothing going on there another thing crew of thieves pointed out is that it is very very likely that we will see the speaking trumpet as the new item with the hungering deep which is basically just a tool to communicate with other players over further distances and that is something that makes a lot of sense in the context of the event, saying that they want to have some sort of tool that brings people together. This would be the perfect one for it. And you can actually see that there are a lot of different variations of it already for us to look at, which is pretty cool. And on the topic of new features, there was also a question on Twitter. Spoilmilk1134 asked, wondering if there will ever be a tattoo artist in the game. Sea of Thieves responded with more tattoos are on the way, which kind of sounds promising, either as a tattoo artist in game or as just another customization option for post customization, so to speak. But not only that, there's another very tiny feature that we'll probably see at some point in the future. Just today, Rare reposted their March roundup of information of what has been happening in March. There's no new information in that in itself, but it was a bit curious that they retweeted it. Maybe this was on purpose, maybe they wanted us to find this minor detail, or maybe it was just coincidence. But the first picture in the post actually shows us sales that are not in the game yet. And to be honest, in my opinion, those are the coolest sales I have seen so far. The sales are black in the middle and then have red stripes on the side and seem to have some sort of white skull or something on the middle sail. When we will get these in the game, or how we will get them is unclear, but they seem to at least be there, the model for them seems to be there, because otherwise I doubt they would have had a screenshot of them. This is especially cool because I know that black sails are a much requested feature by many players, because they want to feel like real pirates. And then there was also the Sea of Thieves podcast. Now this podcast was mostly talking about everything related or surrounding Sea of Thieves launch. There was a lot of talk about specific examples of what happened in specific situations. I'm going to leave that out and just go more over the general details. The first part was actually very much focused on the trailer of the game and getting the actor for it. It's for the trailer, which is basically the Museum of Pirates. And yeah, that was what they started off with. Then they went into the development of the game. First of all, saying that the game has literally millions of players and sees very fast growth. At the same time, they also say that they weren't prepared for that growth. They was kind of trying to say something about how many thousands they get, but they definitely did not expect this growth that quickly. 
and they didn't feel like they could have anticipated that. They also talk about how hard it is for them to converse with players because they can't respond to every single tweet, sometimes because tweets are just not the right platform to elaborate on a bigger project or something, but also because they have to be very, very careful with their wording regarding anything. This especially goes for content because any teased content or anything will basically be analyzed down to every detail, like I do that as well, and will end up on Reddit or news sources, so they have to be very, very careful what they write and sometimes can't respond in situations where they really like to. They also say that they want to keep a little bit of mystery surrounding future spoilers. They want to do those spoilers for us and give us a hint of what's coming, but they don't want to outright tell us what the next feature will be because they like the speculation around it and everything and give the whole thing a bit more mystery that way. They say that at the moment more than 100 developers are working on future content. They didn't specify what content or how the split is here, but it's good to know that they at least have a lot of people working towards what's coming up next. The next point of conversation was very interesting because it was a bit of a unique perspective, I would call it, on how they expected people to play the game, to consume the game, and how they expected them not to consume it. They basically said that the game is not intended to be consumed in a hey, I've done everything kind of way, where you kind of just achieve the goal and then you're like, hey, what can I do next? I've done everything now but rather something they expected to be more played on the weekend with your family or something. Now, I think that's a bit of an unrealistic perspective. First of all, we always have those achievement hunters, speedrunners and all that, that just want to get everything done and reach that end goal and then hope that something else comes up afterwards. And on the other hand, the kind of fraction of family gamers obviously exists, but I don't think it's the majority of gamers. I think I would kind of fall more towards that category. I'm not playing with my family, but I'm playing less than many others and just enjoy the game when I feel like playing it. But obviously, especially when you make a game your main game, then you will invest a decent amount of time into it. The developers quote a news article here saying that Sea of Thieves isn't a game, but a place to be. And they indirectly elaborate on that afterwards, explaining or describing different events that they have witnessed or different things that have popped up on the Reddit on the forums. For example, people toying around with the siren light style, basically switching between the Order of Souls light and the front lights of the ship and playing police or a player handing over a chest to a new player and stuff like that and say that that's the kind of thing they were envisioning basically, hoping for people to have all these interactions and make their own fun. And I think that is fair, I think that is you know, a good thing overall, but at the same time I will say that the tools for that at this point are still fairly limited, so as much as I think this is a nice vision, there are many situations where you won't have that, where you'll still have that downtime of just sailing from A to B and not having other ships around and then that whole concept falls apart a little bit. They are kind of surprised about the fact that people were racing to become a pirate legend, they didn't plan for people to play this way, apparently, which I find odd because there's always those ones that want to be first in any kind of game. But, well, that's what it is now, basically, and they said, well, they had their own fun along the way. Then we hear a little bit of talk about how the developers played themselves and what experiences they had, for example, describing how one of the players was playing with another player and they met some brand new players and actually handed over one of their chests to them and stuff like that. It's nice to listen to, uh, but just gives a bit more of a feeling of the experience the developers have themselves. And in that context, they also point out that most of the people in the studio are playing themselves and have been playing after release, which for them was kind of unexpected as usually you will have developers being somewhat fed up at the point of release with the game because they had to test so much and they won't really play themselves anymore. They briefly touch upon game fixes and bringing groups of friends together to play. They go a bit more into detail about that later though. But first they talk about the shift in content plans, saying that they want to focus on the content that brings the best value to the game, which is why they delayed pets and ship captaincy. Literally getting the people that were working on that off that for now, saying you get a nice job so far, you'll have to continue that at another point because we have to do other things first that bring more value to the player or especially bring more value to many players. As such, they want to be reactive with content, we've heard that a few times now. And then they go on to explain the whole brick abuse thing a little more, 
say that the brick abuse itself wasn't the problem that they saw, but rather the reasons for the brick abuse were the issues in themselves. People would put others in the brick because they were randoms, because they didn't have voice chat, because they spoke another language and all that. And that's what they were trying to tackle by fixing exactly those things through putting people with voice chat with other people with voice chat, matching by region and all that kind of stuff, language rather, or even allowing people to just lock their team and not let other people in so they play with three people on a galleon or whatever. So there is a lot of approach to how those things are being fixed. And in the same context, they also talk about cheating and toxicity, saying that it's being analyzed a lot, action is being taken where necessary, but they also check how common these things are, because sometimes people get the impression that they are all over the place and it turns out that's only a few people that are affected. They say that behavior of that sort, especially hacking, is not tolerated and there's a zero tolerance policy in place, meaning you can get escalated up to a platform level ban for those kind of things. So you probably don't want to cheat in Sea of Thieves. But at the same time, they also say that Sea of Thieves doesn't really encourage hacking by design because it's not really a game where you can win over other players all too much and you don't have this constant battle with other player situation. It is part of the game, but it's not the focus. So it is not exactly the game where most people would focus their hacking efforts on, basically. Then they talk a bit about what they have been working on in particular. One of the guys says that he has to be very wary of what he states at this point and is very careful with his wording once again because a tweet can turn into a whole news article. Another states that he's very much focused on the balance of the climate within the company because on one hand the game sold very well and therefore requires a lot more fixing than expected because many things are not up to the capacity or were not up to the capacity at least but on the other hand, people are really enjoying the game and his responsibility is making sure that people within the company feel like they have done a good job so far and realize that the, most of the people are happy with what they have so far. But at the same time, they have to work on those things that are not there yet, basically, or that need fixing and he needs to find an even balance between that. They also say that they will release some sort of weekly update, not always a podcast, on the CFT's channel every single week obviously weekly so we can expect more information that way in the future as well so nothing crazy new here on the podcast but a little bit more insight into many things and it's actually turned out a fair bit longer than i expected and with that thank you guys very much for watching i hope this was interesting and insightful feel free to check out one of the other sea of these videos which should hopefully be linked right here combat guide or some of the other information on the upcoming content and other than that, if you're new to the channel, feel free to click the sub button and the bell, it really helps me out. See you for the next one tomorrow. Bukesloth, out. What shall we do when we have no outro? What shall we do when we have no outro? What shall we do when we have no outro early in the morning? Just sing some random stuff, just sing some random stuff, just sing some random stuff early in the morning.